truthfully, and I think if we were all being truthful about it, praying is a somewhat unnatural activity for most of us, right? I mean, from birth, we have learned the rule of self-reliance as we strain and struggle to achieve self-sufficiency. Uh, prayer, prayer flies in the face of those deep-seated values. It's an assault on, on our autonomy. It, it subverts our American ideal of rugged, rugged individualism and independence, right? To people who are in the, the fast lane of life, for people who are determined to make it on their own. Prayer is almost an embarrassing interruption into their lives. For many of us, prayer is alien to our, to our proud, independent nature. And yet, and yet, someplace, somewhere along the line, probably each and every one of us reached the point of falling on our knees, fixing our attention on God and praying nonetheless. Now, of course, we might might be that person who kind of looks both ways to make sure nobody notices that we might be praying, right? You don't want to get caught doing that kind of stuff. Might blush when we pray. But in spite of the foreignness of that sometimes, the way that feels anyhow, we do pray, right? Most of us. Why, why are we drawn to prayer? Well, we pray because either by intuition or by experience, we understand at some fundamental level that the most intimate communion that we can have with God comes only through prayer. Ask someone who's, who's, who's hit that wall of life, right? Someone who's experienced tragedy, trial, struggle, pain, grief, loss, loneliness. Ask them what happened when they finally fell on their knees. When they finally poured their hearts out to God. It's it's in those moments, those moments of surrender, where many feel a nearness to God that they have never experienced before or since. It's where they feel closest to God in their life, more deeply connected to Him. The Apostle Paul experienced this very thing. Writing to the the Christians at Philippi, Paul says, Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Philippians 4, 6, and 7. Now you might say, well, pastor, I mean, well, you're you're a pastor, right? You have to be good at praying, right? Well, yes and no. Well, I, I am perfectly fine and comfortable of of praying at a moment's notice. That's not a problem. You can ask me anywhere, anytime. I'd be happy to pray for you or pray for whatever. That's not a problem for me, right? But truly, that wasn't always the case. And truly, I, I, I honestly, I would readily admit, readily admit, that prayer has not always been my strong suit. And within that, I guarantee you, there are people in this church who are better prayers than me. They are. My wife, better prayer than me. The the ladies who lead our prayer team, they're they're like the Michael Jordans of prayer, and I'm still on like the the JV high school team, right? I mean, there's some of you have calluses on your knees from 70-plus years of praying. I can't come close to that. So I would readily admit, well, yeah, I I can pray. I'm certainly, certainly not the best. Learning to pray pray is a journey. And I, just like all of you, am indeed on that journey. Just a little self-humbling, I'll tell you about, maybe I've shared this once before, I don't remember, but tell you a story at the very least of the first time I ever prayed publicly. Okay? 
if you don't know my background, I didn't become a Christian until I was an adult in college. And uh, I had started working for the Boy Scouts of America. I was kind of in my second assignment with them. I'd landed in Mitchell, South Dakota, had joined uh, one of our sister churches, a church called Northridge Baptist Church. They're a very, very good church. And uh, there at Northridge, I started plugging in with some of the men's ministries. And one of the ministries they had was uh, in town there, there was a, a church league basketball league. Now, well, I loved playing basketball. All right, I'll go play basketball with these guys. Sounds like a good good f- place to go and meet some people. I was new to town, and I like basketball. It was a chance to go to the gym and hang out with some guys. All right, awesome. So I went and played basketball. Four, five, six weeks transpired, and we had fun. We won most of the games, but not all of the games. And everything was going great. And, and every week before the basketball game, everybody in the gym would circle around center court and have a moment's prayer. And somebody would lead it, and we'd all bow our heads, and everybody would say a prayer, and then we'd go, you know, tackle each other playing men's basketball. That's what we do. And uh, it was fun. So probably the sixth or seventh week, we all get there, and and we're all piled around center court, and Pastor John Tolley was my pastor, and John taps me on the arm, and he says, all right, it's your turn to pray. Everybody's heads are bowed, and I'm looking around going what? And I'm sure I stood there for an uncomfortable length of time before I even said anything. And then I said something. I have no idea what. And I'm sure it was probably the worst prayer in the history of men's league basketball. I I was drenched in sweat by the time I was done praying. The nervous flop sweat. You know what I'm talking about? You ever been there before? That was me. And I said, amen. A bunch of other guys said, amen. And we played basketball and life went on. I have never been so scared in my life. I thought I might pass out. Why? Well, I'd never done this before. I'd never practiced it before. I was not, I was not ready to be put into the game yet, coach. Right? I had never practiced it. And and our spirits, like our bodies, have requirements for health and growth. And the truth of the matter is some people don't want to pay the price of developing good spiritual habits. But we have to practice at this to get good at it. And sadly, many people end up paying the high spiritual price of not developing this component of their walk with Christ. We can't expect to just wave a magic prayer wand, right? And all of a sudden have a meaningful and deep prayer life. It doesn't work that way. It takes time. It takes practice. And when we build up this habit of prayer, it's then that we stay consistently tuned to God's presence. And it's in that then where we are open to receive His blessing. So... How can we learn that heart-building habit of prayer? Those practices that that expand our freedom and and give us, so to speak, our spiritual wings. So if we're ever called upon at the men's basketball league to pray, we're ready, right? Well, normally I tell you, well, ask an expert. That's how you get good at something, right? But you get me instead. So you get what you pay for today, okay? And and while I do say that a little slightly jokingly, uh, I share these tips and these tools today because they revolutionized my prayer life. They transformed my ability to pray many, many years ago. And they continue to guide me to this day and are the foundation for my ongoing prayer life. Everything you hear from this point forward is things that I fundamentally use on a daily basis to pray. You'll find, if you want to know how I learned this, back in my days at Northridge, after I was exposed, I, I, I do not like being exposed as being incompetent at something. I hate that feeling. So after that basketball game, I said, I'm going to get better at prayer. How do I do that? Well, so I asked my pastor, and he said, well, 
here's a book. This is a really good book. I think you'll like it. It was a book uh, by a man by the name of Bill Hybels. He's a pastor of a big church in the Chicago area. And it's a book called Too Busy Not to Pray. And, and there's lots of good books out there on prayer. This just happened to be the one that was given to me. And I read it, and I tell you what, it has been one of the top three most influential lives in my, or books in my life. And I've read a lot of books. You can go see my library. It's big. But this, without question, has been one of the absolute biggest influences in my life. All categories. I have given away dozens of copies of the book. Um, I have three copies in my office at this very moment because I'm prone to giving this away and then I end up not having a copy. So I just buy extras and keep them around in case somebody wants one. Great, great book. Bill Hybels, Too Busy Not to Pray. And so these are the things that I do. I'm not speaking theory. This is practice. But before I get to that, I think whenever we do talk about prayer... We should obviously start with the best prayer, right? Jesus, of course. I mean, nobody ever understood prayer better than Jesus. No one's ever believed more strongly in the power of prayer. No one has ever prayed like he did. Now his disciples, they recognized his expertise. One day it tells us in the Bible, in Luke 11, that they kind of stumbled upon Jesus and found him while he was praying privately. And they were so moved by the earnestness and the intensity of his prayer that his disciples say to Jesus, Jesus, would you, would you, Jesus, would you teach us how to pray? And so then we see a, a more full, full-blown account of this in Matthew 6, 5 through 13, where we see what Jesus tells them in response to this request. And so in Matthew, he says, and when you pray... You must not pray like the hypocrites, right? For they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and on the street corners so that they might be seen by others. Truly, I say to you, they have already received their reward. But when you pray, go into your room, shut the door, and pray to your Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees it in secret will reward you. And when you pray, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think that they will be heard with their many words. Do not be like them, Jesus says, for your Father knows what you need before you even ask Him. Pray like this then. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts or sins as we forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. Now many of you, of course, probably all of you, know this as the Lord's Prayer. I mean, no other passage in Scripture tells us quite so straightforwardly how to pray. And the advice that Jesus offered to his disciples 2,000 years ago still applies to us today. First, pray regularly. Jesus said when you pray, not if you pray, when you pray, right? Pray regularly. Second, pray privately. God isn't impressed by public displays of piety. That's not what he's asking of us. Third, pray sincerely. God's not interested in formulas. He doesn't want some rote prayer that you memorized and you just blah, 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 but you don't actually think about it because you're thinking about what you're cooking for supper, but you're rattling off some, some prayer that you had memorized 25 years ago. That's not a conversation with God. Pray sincerely. He wants to hear what's on our hearts. And then pray specifically. Take the the prayer that we call as the Lord's Prayer, and use that as a, an outline, a model for where to begin our prayer life. And if that's the, the rough outline of our prayer life, then the next question is, well, when and where should we pray? Well, I want to suggest that we need to be intentional in our prayer life. Because the truth of the matter is, if we're not intentional about, intentional about praying, it won't happen. For most of us, if we don't do it with a very specific intentionality, 
prayer gets crowded out of your life very easily. I, I know, first-hand experience. Happens to me too. It doesn't happen by accident. So it's important to have a regular prayer time. Because without regularity, prayer will never become a habit. If we want to live in God's presence, we need to find a time to shut out the world. Focus on God. Tune into Him. Look at Him. Talk to Him. Listen to Him. Sit quietly before Him and hear from Him. So for most of us, this will require that we get away from the distractions of life in the world. How many of you have heard of a prayer closet? Some of you? Yeah, a few of you, right? How many of you have a prayer closet? And that's what I thought. Let me share with you a little bit on that. Because it's obvious, most of us aren't utilizing it, right? Let me tell you about prayer closets. Now, I'm not saying you need to go take your brooms and your mops out of the closet and go in the dark with a candle and sit in there and pray. Although, maybe that's the only place you can do it, and that's fine if so. But your prayer closet is more of this idea. You need a set-aside sort of place where you're going to go and you're going to pray and specifically not be distracted by other things. So, for instance, I can't do this in my TV room. Right? There's a TV. My son wants to come in and play Wii or Xbox. Um... You know, I can look out and be distracted by all the beauty in my backyard. And there's my computer sitting there. And there's all kinds of stuff. The phone and just, that's not the place. Okay? I need to go somewhere where I don't have those sorts of distractions. So my primary place in this world where I do this is here at church. Because I'm here most days of the week. I've got a really comfortable Lazy Boy recliner chair in my office, if you haven't noticed. And, uh... That's both my reading and my praying chair. And so when I sit in that chair, my computer is on the other side of the room. The phone is on the other side of the room. I don't have my cell phone on me. I keep that on my desk. And I can go there and not be distracted. And I can sit for even just a minute or two and be focused. Now, that that works well for me. You have to decide what works for you. Uh, A friend of mine, who used to be in one of my small groups, um, was a man who worked on the road, drove constantly, 70,000, 80,000 miles a year. So for him, every day at noon, he would find a parking lot, he'd pull his car over into that parking lot, he would shut the car off, he would turn the radio off, he would turn his phone off, and that would become his prayer closet, because that was all he had. But he was intentional about it. A man from my church in Mitchell, South Dakota, was one of our deacons and uh, a great man of prayer, was a farmer. Well, nearly every single day of his life, he found himself in a particular tractor that he used for most of the work on the farm. So he turned that tractor into his prayer closet. It's not about specifically where you do it. It's about specifically having a place where you can tune out the rest of the world for a few moments and commune with God. Do that every day. And amazing things will happen in your prayer life. You'll have to decide where it is and when it is for you. I can't do that for you. But if you do this, I assure you God will reward you with amazing things. Amazing things. Now that we have that all sorted out, then the question becomes, well, how do we pray, right? And I'm going to offer to you a pattern to follow. It's not the best pattern. It's not the only pattern. It's just a pattern. It's the pattern I use. It's the one, like I said, I learned this from Bill Hybels' book, Too Busy Not to Pray. But it works incredibly well for me, and I want to share it with you. It's good to have a rhythm and a pattern. And, And it's very simple. It's the acronym ACTS, A-C-T-S, right? Like the book of ACTS, A-C-T-S, which is simply a four-letter acrostic, and the letters stand for adoration, confession, thanksgiving, and supplication. Okay, and I'm going to explain those, so don't panic. 
A, adoration, right? Here's the nuts and bolts. Adoration sets the tone for the entire prayer. It, it reminds us of who it is that we are addressing. It reminds us of whose presence that we have entered into. Whose attention we have gained. Often in life, our, 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 our trials, our problems, our needs seem so pressing, right? That, that it ends up reducing our prayers to just basically giving God a wish list. That, that happens. But when we commit ourselves to beginning all of our prayers with adoration, it forces us to, to slow down, to focus our attention on God instead of on us. Adoration reminds us of God's identity, of who He is. And in adoration, one of the things that we do is we, we, we address God, lifting up His attributes, His character, His personality. And as we do that, it reinforces our understanding of who God is. So let me give you an example of that. One of the ways that I like to do this, and you could do this as well, is you could simply start your prayer. God, I thank you for your omnipotence. Right? Omnipotence. He's, he's all-knowing. When I say, God, I thank you for your omnipotence, I thank you that you know everything, it reminds me of, this is the God who's going to be helping me. No matter how difficult my problems might be, he knows it all. He has a plan. No matter how difficult or how big, He is there in it with me. And then maybe I'll move on to God. Thank you for your omniscience. No mystery confounds Him. Omnipresence. A lot of omni words this morning. Thank you, God, for your omnipresence. Thank you, God, that you are everywhere. There is nowhere that I go that God is not and has not already been. Wherever we are, it doesn't matter. In your tractor, in your car, in your bathroom, at home, at school, at work, wherever. God is with you. And so I praise God for that. It allows me to be centered and focused on Him. And when we start praying about these attributes, and there's many other attributes of God, if you'd like a list, I'd gladly get you one. He's righteous and just and merciful, loving. When we start to focus on those attributes of God. It reminds us, we are praying to a tremendous God. And that should motivate us then to continue praying. And not only that, but the other thing adoration does is it purifies us as we pray. When we've spent a, a few minutes praising God for who He is, it begins to soften our own spirit. And our agenda begins to change. Those burning issues we were dying to, to bring God's attention to now seem a little less crucial. Adoration purges our spirit and prepares us to listen to God. So adoration is the right place for us to get started. The second place for us is the C, right? A for adoration, C is confession. How many of you like confession? Confession is probably the most neglected area of personal prayer today. So if you didn't just raise your hand like everybody, there you go. And now we might hear, you know, some church traditions you might hear, you know, Lord, forgive us for our sins, right? Forgive our many sins. And that's okay, nothing wrong with that. But the problem is then we carry that mentality into our private prayer life. Where, where we come before God and we just say, And God, forgive me of my sins. Amen. Right? That's not confession. That's like saying, Here's my pile of stinking sin. There you go, God. Thanks. Amen. And when we do that, and we got... Just cover this up. Make it go away, right? When we try to just take care of it as one big group, when we lump 
all of our sins together and we confess them as one, it's not nearly as painful or as embarrassing as it should be. You see, if I, if I, if I stop and I start taking those sins out one by one, ooh. You ever walked into a teenager's room and you had to like pick up a big pile of dirty clothes, you quickly get it in the wash, right? And you get rid of it. Now imagine if you had to transport each one of those smelly socks one by one. That smell's going to linger for a while and you're going to have to keep smelling and it's going to take some time and ooh, gross, right? Well, when we're dealing with our sin, we need to get to that level. We can't just say, God, fix it all. No. We need to come before God and be honest. Confessing our sin. The truth of the matter is God is already aware of that pile of sin that we have. But He wants us to be aware of it too. And it's not until we understand the depth of our brokenness that we can fully appreciate the gift of God's forgiveness. Until we know the cost of our sin we cannot understand the gift of the gospel and the blessing it is on our behalf. You see, after about the fifth day of going over to this dirty, stinking pile of sin and having to pull that same rotten one out and confessing it to God, usually by the fifth time, it starts getting through your head like, I think I got a problem here. Right? Some of us are a bit slow. It might take you ten times. But if you keep going back to that pile, pulling that same stinky sock out, you're going to go, I thought I washed this one yesterday. Why is it here again? Maybe I need to do something about this. Maybe there's a a pattern here. Maybe this is something I should deal with. Being specific in our confession will help you identify and then change where you need to change. We are sinners in need of a Savior, let's be honest. And because of that, confession is an important part of our prayer. The third stage is the T. They get faster. Won't take me too long here. T is thanksgiving. The Apostle Paul writes in 1 Thessalonians 5.18, Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Most of us have so much to give thanks for. I mean, if we were honest in this section of prayer, we could go on and on and on, right? I don't think you necessarily need to do that. But I do think you need to have a focused time of simply giving thanks to God for what He's blessed you with. It helps us remember just how blessed we are. You've probably heard this phrase before, but... I I, I like to think of it in this way. I mean, what if tomorrow you woke up with only what you had thanked God for today? Right? What would you have? If I only thank God for four things, that's all I woke up with tomorrow. I might need to work on my thankfulness. No, you don't have to thank God for each and everything every day. But certainly, we probably, most of us could be better at this. Four kinds of things that you could give thanks for each and every day on a regular basis. Answered prayers, spiritual blessings, relational blessings, and then material blessings. If you just give thanks for something in one of those four categories each day, you'll find that pretty much everything in your life fits in there. And over time, if you are regular in giving thanks, you will Give thanks to God for much of what He has done for you. That's one of the ways to start off with thanksgiving. Thanksgiving is crucial in developing a well-rounded prayer life. The fourth and final stage is the S. Supplication. This is the one that's most confusing because most people don't know what supplication means. But this is where we ask God for help, right? This is the one most of us are pretty good at already. This is our requests. I read this earlier, but hear it again. Philippians 4, 6. In everything, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests 
to God. If you've adored Him and confessed your sin and thanked Him for all of His good gifts, now comes the time, right? Where you are ready to tell God what it is you need. And nothing is too big for God to handle and nothing is too small for Him to be interested in. This is the area that has come most naturally to most of us. But keep in mind a couple of things as you do this. Just because you ask doesn't mean you'll get it. But the Bible does tell us if we don't ask, we will not get it. So bring your prayers and petitions before the Lord. You have not because you ask not. The Bible tells us very clearly. But sometimes we are going to ask God for something. And it's not going to happen. Why is that, Pastor? Well, God often answers our requests in one of four ways. No. That is a real possibility. God will tell you no. God will tell you slow. Or he'll tell you to grow. Or finally, the one you want to hear is go. Right? If the request is wrong, God's going to say no. If the timing is wrong, God's going to say slow. If you are wrong, God's going to say grow. And finally, if it's truly according to God's will, he's going to say go. But whatever it is, whatever it is, never be afraid to take it before the Lord. No prayer is too small. No prayer is too silly. He is listening. He cares for you. So bring your requests to Him. One final tool that I want to share with you. And then I'm going to give you some homework and then we're going to go home. The final sharing I want to give you is a very simple but challenging thing. It's called prayer journaling. Anybody ever prayer journaled before? Yeah? A few of you. Okay, prayer journaling is awesome. Prayer journaling... The first time I did it, I will tell you, I wasn't very good at it. I wasn't very consistent at it. I struggled with it. I'm not a journaler. And it was difficult for me. But I stuck with it, and it got easier, and it got better. But the problem is with prayer journaling is you got to have to do it for a little while before you're going to see some fruit from it. But I would encourage you, take me seriously on this and do it. Because... Here's the deal. This is where you're going to see the reward. How many of you remember what you were praying for a month ago today? Right? I don't remember. So how do you know? Did God answer those prayers? Maybe. When you prayer journal, what you do is you sit down, just a piece of paper. You could do it in your phone. If you're, if you're digital, you could sit at your computer and do it create a spreadsheet or a Google document or whatever it is you want to use. And just make notes of the things that you are praying for so that a week from now, a month from now, a year from now, you can look back at that. You can read through that and say, oh yeah, I was praying for that. Wow. God really showed up there. As I've learned over the years in prayer journaling and I've gone back and looked at what I was praying for, I have seen amazing things. And one of the biggest challenges to prayer is we pray and then we don't see the results, right? And that can be discouraging and frustrating. But with a prayer journal, I look back. And now I have decades worth of these journals. And I can see things I was praying for. I look back at the one when I first met my wife. Before we were married, we were still dating. I read through that and it's like, wow. I had no idea God was working in this way. What an amazing blessing. I look back at illnesses and sicknesses for people I was praying for, challenges at work. I look back for all kinds of things. And as I read through that, it is a testimony of the faithfulness and the amazingness of God's response to my prayers. It blows me away. But if I don't do it, I have no way of knowing that. So here's your assignment for the week. 
give Acts a run, get out a piece of paper, open up a spreadsheet, put something on your phone, Every day, write down the ACTS. And then write out a little something that goes with each one of those. Find a little quiet space and a quiet place where you can set some time off to the side, even if it's just two minutes, where you're not going to be distracted. And spend some time praying to God. Ideally, 10-10. But if not at 10-10, Let this remind you to do it every day. Put this on your wrist. So every time you look down, oh yeah, I need to pray. And as you pray, and as you keep track of it, I guarantee it, you will see God do amazing things. He's promised. So that's your homework for a week. Go and pray. Why don't we do it right now and then we'll leave.